So today we're going to talk about Cadman's Hymn. Now, Cadman's Hymn is purported to be the first Old English poem, which makes it the first English poem. But the problem is that with Old English poetry, wait, wait, hold on, my glass sunglasses are on. They look fine. All right. But with Old English poetry, the dating is not always entirely clear. Let me give an example. The poems we're going to be reading, the elegies and the riddles, come from a manuscript called the Exeter Book. Now, the Exeter Book is dated from the 10th century. As for Beowulf, which most of you have read in high school, that came from another manuscript called Cotton Vitellius A. And that one's dated from the early 11th century. But it could have been produced at night between 975 and 1025, which would be early 11th century. So it could have been a little earlier. We're never quite clear when Old English texts were written. It could be between 800, 700 to the year 1000. All right? That means proposing dates is always imprecise. Now, much of this has to do with a huge linguistic disruption that happened in England dated conveniently at 1066, the famous 1066 when the Normans invade Britain. And because of this invasion, the English language, as we're told, starts to change. Now, England was always subject to invasions. It was an island like this is. So it was all it was not a secure boundary as Many people think of islands being secure. If we look at the opening of Bede's Historium Britannium, the source of the Cataman Hymn story that you've read, it opens with a series of invasions. The Celts cross into Britain by boat, and then the Picts who go to Scotland. And then Julius Caesar comes with his Roman army by boat, and those Celts that are in Britain become Romanized, and they become the Britons. But then Rome is invaded, so the Romans leave. This is a very, very quick version between the 3rd and 5th century. They leave, but they build a famous wall across England that will separate the Britons now, who are now the Romanized Celts, from the Picts who are in Scotland. But the poor Christian Britons are terrorized by the Picts who are constantly attacking, as well as we should point out the pagan Scots from Ireland. And so they call on help from German mercenaries, the famous Saxon Angles and Jutes, AKA the Anglo-Saxons. And these people speak a Germanic language, the language that will become Old English. And they also cross by boats. The Germans then, push back against the Picts and the Scots. The Picts being the Scottish, the Scots being the Irish. But then these German mercenaries turn on their employers and the result is some of the Britons flee into exile to Brittany and France and the others head west to what is called Wales. Then those German tribes, those Anglo-Saxons as they're called now, become Christianized. And Bede, writing in the 8th century, in Latin, and he is an Anglo-Saxon, uh, opens his book on the languages spoken in Britain. And it's a very famous snapshot of England, which England means the Angles land, right? The land of the Angles. He says this is 731. At the present time, remember he's writing in 731, there are in Britain, in harmony with the five books of the divine law, he's speaking about the Bible, five languages and four nations. The English, the Britons, the Scots, that's the Irish there written in the translation, and the Picts, those are the, the people living in Scotland. Each of these have their own language, but all are united in their study of God's truth by the fifth, Latin, which has become a common medium through the study of the scriptures. He wrote this in 731. 
he had no idea that in 60 years, in 793, the pagan Vikings speaking Old Norse, and Old Norse is still spoken in Iceland, so if you go to Iceland and you speak Icelandic, you're really speaking Old Norse. He had no idea that these Vikings would invade and take over half of England. And then, 300 years later, in 1066, the Vikings who had taken over the northern coast of France and then assimilated to French culture, we call them the Normans, that means Norsemen, they too would invade England. And again, they would do it by boat. These people too, both the Vikings and the Normans, well, I should, well we shouldn't say Normans, but the Vikings and the French would alter the Anglo-Saxon language spoken by the original invaders. Now I say Normans with hesitancy because the Normans actually did not transform English. There's only, there's only a few Norman French words that appear in the English language. Most of them have to do with justice. The vast volume of French words come from the French after the Normans. They're called the Angevin kings. But to get back to Old English, you speak Old English in some ways. You can unwrap those words and hear that you is Old English yao. Speak, sprekest, old, elde, and English, angla. So you are still speaking the Old English tongue. But you've also added in your words some Old Norse, like they, there, and them. Whenever you use they, there, and them, that's Old Norse, that's Viking. Dittos with the word that sound SK. SK, the sk sound, that's also a Viking sound. Like words like skin or scrape or skull. SH sounds like sh, those are the Old English sounds. So for example, some of our words reflect both an Old English and an Old Norse relationship. Shirt versus skirt. Somewhere along the line, the shirt part took the top part and the skirt part took the bottom part, but they were the same word and they meant the same thing originally. Dittos with ship and skipper. There is some Celt in your language. But most of that comes with the word do. Like when you say, he did eat that, or did you do that? That did and do? That is a Germanic word put on top of a Celt construction. And finally, with the French words, well, half your vocabulary is built out of French words. By the time you hit the 14th century, French is fashionable. Words are being imported at an enormous rate into the English vocabulary. And the language that is formed is what we call Middle English. That's the language of Chaucer. And it only takes a few more steps and you're into Modern English. It's not that hard. But let's look now at this first English poem, Cataman Hymn. No, we shall inherit heaven reaches word may a toad is made on his mod ye thank work wolder failure swa he wonder ye ways etch dreiten or unstelde hey heiress shop earthen bernum heaven to hrofa kaily shippend the midden yard mon kunis word Etch dreiten, after Theod firum foldan, Frey Almighty. When you look at Cataman's hymn, it looks completely alien, doesn't it? Completely incomprehensible. Part of this explains why so little Old English poetry compared to Middle English survives. The linguistic changes were radical. Also, the production of Old English manuscripts naturally stops with the Norman invasion. The Normans are always attributed with giving French to 
the English language. It's actually not true. The Normans weren't interested in changing the English language. The Normans weren't interested in, in importing French words. The Normans were interested in Latin reforms. Their worry was that the Anglo-Saxons didn't know enough Latin, so England was isolated from the larger continent. It's the Angevin kings with their fashionable poetry, you know, the great poetry of Machaut, Foissal, Deschamps, that becomes the attraction to adding French words to the English language. But why would these old English manuscripts also not exist or stop being produced or have such a low survival rate? It's because they weren't relevant. But you have to think that mindset is a death knell to old cultures, right? When you think something is not relevant, that means it has no worth anymore, right? Your only focus is on the present and its value. The past then is judged always as inferior. And we're going through that right now. And when you take that mindset, things start to get lost and things stop surviving. Plus remember that in the Middle Ages, books are handwritten. They're copies of handwritten copies. But a lot of the stuff you're going to read, there's only one copy out there. We're lucky, for example, that Beowulf survives at all. In fact, Beowulf survived a fire. Let me compare this to the Canterbury Tales. The Canterbury Tales has 90 surviving manuscripts. Beowulf has one. And Beowulf's, as I said, caught fire. And its pages, if you look at these images, are burned at the edges. Imagine if that fire had spread further. Goodbye Grendel, goodbye Grendel's mother, goodbye dragon. And that means if the dragon disappears in that fire, goodbye J.R. Tolkien's Hobbit, goodbye Middle Earth, and goodbye Narnia. Because you remember those of you who've read Narnia, in Don Treader, there is an old dragon. And that old dragon is kind of a joke. It's a joke on J.R. Tolkien, and it's a joke on Beowulf. That would be a huge loss. The, the manuscript, for example, that contains the elegies and the riddles, the Exeter book, let me show you what Bernard Muir said about that manuscript. It was used as a cutting board, as the slashes on its front leaves or pages show. A messy pot, perhaps of glue, was placed on its exposed first folio or page on at least one occasion. A fiery brand was placed upon its exposed back with apparent indifference. A vessel containing liquid, perhaps a beer mug, has made a circular stain near the center of folio 8. The liquid has spilled over a large portion of this page and has gone through to the next folios, also causing a brown stain on these folios and making the text in some places very difficult to read. What you're seeing with these manuscripts and their, and their wretched status and Beowulf on fire is that the Normans and the French people of the time and the people who speaking Middle English, they didn't think Old English was worth preserving. What a disaster this is. Imagine what has been lost. We have Beowulf and a few other poems. Can you imagine what else was lost in these, uh, this lack of interest? There are only four books of Old English literature that survives, four manuscripts. That's it. That means we've already lost some amazing tales and characters. So appreciate what we have here now. It's part of your culture and it is relevant. In the next episode, we'll look at Cataman's Hymn and see why it's so important. Alright guys, don't forget to like and subscribe and ring that notification bell.